So continuing in the series of uh, one concept at a time. We'll cover critical theory. Um, fair warning, those of you that are already familiar with critical theory and uh, those of you that actually enjoy it, prefer it, great. You may not like this video. I am uh, not of the fan camp of critical theory. Um, but let's launch. Why critical theory? Why did I pick on this? Um, it's relatively, relatively new. When I say relatively, I mean, although it has a history that dates back to say, Immanuel Kant, like 1800s, mid 1800s, um, it, it didn't come on the scene in its full regalia as it is now. It actually trickled into thinking um, over time, and it has acquired a specific uh, set of characteristics, and it really didn't make itself known in its full glory until, say, the mid-century, last century, and then really in its full, you know, seething mass form. Um, it really started being part of the common parlance, to the degree that it even is, um, in the last, I don't know, 10 years, I would say, the last two years, most, uh, most virulently. And um, my problem with it is that, although upon its introduction, it was based on positive intent, um, it was introduced by a well-regarded thinker, um, even then, it had some viral elements packaged into it that were hidden, and uh, and now, since we're going to go to this uh, um, metaphor of a pathogen, it really, really showed its um, virulence throughout the ages. If you were to think of critical theory and its mutations as a pathogen, as a virus, um, you could say that despite our best efforts of containment, it has escaped, it continues to escape. And it has, to date, um, been responsible for several of, I mean, most of the top, uh, most of the largest pandemics in our history. Um, pandemics that had lethality that can be tallied up in the hundreds of millions. Um, and for those that it did not kill, um, meant they had to go through a lengthy and painful period of recovery. Um, and it had a continuous risk of reoccurrence. Even areas, uh, locales, and populations that seem to have a natural immunity to it, um, it seems that the immunity is declining. And according to, let's say, the World Health Organization, upon last survey, it seems that uh, several new mutated variations of this virus have been found, and it has infected all major population centers and we simply don't know what the incubation period of this new uh, variant is, nor do we know its relative lethality, but there is active reason to be concerned. I'm painting a very bleak picture here, and, I'm, and I'll, you know, I'll walk through it. So let's start from some core basics so we can, uh, uh, we can level set in terms of... Uh, terminology and concepts. Um, I'm isolating down to the idea of a concept. And it's sort of, uh, think of it as sort of the atomos, the, 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 the finest grain that constitutes everything in our shared reality. Um, concepts, thoughts, ideas, whichever way you want to think of them, but let's just agree on the word concept for now, they're basically how we go about doing anything. It is how we think, how we interpret what, that which we see, how we perceive, how we express ourselves, how we describe something, how we remember something, how we lodged it in there, how we interact, how we communicate, how we bond with one another, how we convince one another or manipulate one another. It drives not just our cognitive conscious capabilities, but it's also, it drives our, um, our basically our affective regulation, our emotions. Um, 
it, it's what causes us to attack when we attack or causes us to defend when we feel attacked. Uh, it's how we go about falling in love or, or hating something. Or um, In general, these concepts, these things, these, these patterns of reality that we have lodged in our cognitive schema um, are how we navigate life. And then if we have wrong ones, if we have incorrect ones, if we have, uh, if we have concepts that aren't a valid fit to reality, we tend to fail, and we tend to fail in very painful ways. Um, so let's kind of walk through some of the simple uh, mental di dynamics of these. Um, there are some elements uh, of neurology to it, and I'll go in a, in a different video, I, I will actually go through that, because there's a lot of biology to this on top of just psychology and um, um, a, a general logic. But it, you can imagine concepts as being that which define you. And uh, obviously we value some of them more than others. And um, of course, those that we value, we, we tend to defend more. Um, we acquire them, for example, if we acquire them with uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, from a trusted source or some you know some concepts come to us from childhood or from whatever we have some affinity to them we, we tend to hold on to them. um concepts in general get reinforced by repetition and feedback and they get weaker if they don't get used um and what do i mean by feedback well basically if you if you simplify a concept to the idea of a map for example as long as you keep whenever you keep pulling out that map it gets you to where it's supposed to, it's functional. It's a positive feedback. You accomplish your goal. So therefore, you begin to trust that map more and more because it so far hasn't let you down. And when it does let you down, you begin to doubt the map. It gets weaker. Um, so this concept meeting reality interaction, reality always gives you the correct feedback. Always. You may um, choose to doubt that sometimes, but uh, let's just say if you have an imprecise concept, it will generate, at best, an imprecise result. Um, you may or may not notice it, because the level of imprecision may be such that it might be subconscious. Um, when I say you may or may not notice it, I mean that from a conscious perspective. Uh, your subconscious will. Um, oftentimes, whenever there is uh, an assumption, a concept that we have going into an interaction, for example, Oftentimes you might walk away from an interaction with a sort of head scratchy feeling of like, what the hell just happened? That's usually a sign that one of the assumptions you had going into the interaction was invalid, didn't match reality. And uh, the type of feedback, the type of, uh, let's say, nonverbal cues on top of everything else that you had perceived at a, at a conscious level or a dialogue level, there's been a variety of communication between the two parties that isn't at a conscious level. You know, body language, uh, uh, inflections, it, it's tons of little fragmentary components, but what you picked up, something was wrong, and you will have noticed it. You may not have noticed it consciously. Um, normally, whenever a pattern that we have fails to meet reality, um, fails to get positive feedback from a reality experience, we have a signaling mechanism. We basically, it's, it uses, uh, you know, our brain will, will give us a shot of cortisol, which is uh, the stress hormone, or it gives you dopamine in, uh, in the case of a reward uh, uh, signal. But let's focus on the negative feedback. When you get cortisol, when you get a shot of cortisol, I mean, I'm talking about an imperceptible, you know, minuscule amount. Um, if it's of a certain threshold and you've noticed it, uh, and, and, and the concept or the, the misapplication is such that it adds, is at your up, you know, at the higher level of your cognition, not at the instinctual, then the typical reaction is to trigger a sort of a, you know, small panic, small alarm, and that immediately turns to an introspective reaction. You, you validate, you, you examine the concept you just applied to make sure that it is sound. Now, that is a typical reaction and it's with training and with education you begin to actually develop that as a as a sort of uh, running loop the inner dialogue that continuously challenges your assumptions 
whenever you enter a dialogue, even before you get a negative um, uh, signal in return, because questioning and and uh, and examining your your concept is is a method of staying flexible. Um, so again, uh, you try something, it doesn't work. Little cortisol shot. You examine your concept. If the concept is okay, then you go and uh, examine other things. You know, examine how you implemented it. Examine your environment. You know, maybe something changed in reality. Um, but fundamentally, that's the proper path. Incorrect concepts, so not just imprecise ones, but incorrect ones, they have a vast impact on our life, and it can vary wildly. Um, first and foremost, it isn't simply a mechanical, or sorry, a mental process. It is. Uh, it can be a physical uh, impact. The little shots of cortisol. When you actually are, you might have noticed this, when you're in a state of depression, when you've uh, had some like failures in a row, and you, you're sort of in a negative spiraling sort of uh, uh, line of thinking, you feel horrible. And sometimes it can actually transition beyond just emotional distress or effective deregulation. It can, uh, it can move into that, it can move into serious physical harm because incremental cortisol, incremental stress damages the homeostasis of your body, right? So it's no longer simply a mental um, uh, stress. It, it can be physical. It can uh, then turn into actual physical debilitation. Um, of course, mental and emotional uh, discomfort go hand in hand. I mean, that, 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 that goes without saying. Um, most importantly, it can actually radiate outside of you. It can affect all the others around you. So that's just that's just focusing on imprecise, incorrect, imperfect. Now, there is a whole other class of concepts that I'm terming, for lack of a better term, pernicious. Now, these concepts are both incorrect. They don't match reality. There's some flaw. There's some skew. There's some 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 component in them that is objectively false. But while they're incorrect, they're also deeply valued. You either learn them very young, you are convinced, like for example, let's say you were raised in a specific uh, religion that no longer you know, is valid with your, your, with your everyday life. You were raised in a set of beliefs that is a bit antiquated, whatever. But for whatever reason, you are holding those beliefs very close. Uh, they, they define you, they've, they've, they've been a part of you, or let's say it's something you learned in college from a professor you admired. So you were convinced, and now you tend to be resistive of changing such things. Now, pernicious concepts, um, the deeper they are, the more shielded they are from this reaction of questioning. Even though you may very well be pulling them out and using them often, and getting the negative feedback, Oftentimes, you will ignore the part about questioning the concept. As if, like, whenever you look at this concept, the automatic answer that's sort of stuck on, the, the light is always stuck on, and it says, no problem here, keep going. Therefore, you automatically, you, you almost begin to have a reaction of always blaming someone else, always looking for an external um, reason, never acknowledging the fact that it might be a problem internal to you, never acknowledging the fact that for some reason you're unwilling to look at it, that will be just outside of the periphery of your um, conscious perception. And I've seen this manifest um, in extremely visible ways, uh, and you may have as well in your life, but uh, for example, if you, um, I, I, I remember thinking of uh, some debates that I've seen between uh, uh, Two people where one would hold very very passionate beliefs that were nonetheless uh, incorrect and as they began uh, as they began the the debate both were sort of a, on a confidence even footing but as the other party would begin to make gains you would see not just that not just the mental discomfort not just the the rapid shift in personality and the person that sort of beleaguered but as as the dialogue would get to, let's say that there's like a statement that if completed would, would be so devastating, so, you know, utterly logical, if you would, that it would force you to, to confront whatever it is that you don't want to confront. Um, 
at that point, even the body starts kicking in certain reactions. I mean, I'm not talking about just the general, you know, you can see on the person that he's discomfort, he's got a high level of discomfort, he's getting uh, agitated, angry, emotional, probably, you know, feels horrible, wants to leave, whatever. But um, even little nervous tics that almost seem like they're outside of your direct control. Uh, for example, as the person's speaking, you might happen to like drop something or close the laptop cover or do something, whereas just at the right perfect timing, they would be prevented from hearing the, some component, some word, some piece of the sentence that would, in their conscious perception, cause them to not fully comprehend the sentence or, or simply ignore the sentence or move past the sentence or be able to misinterpret the sentence in such a way that it almost seems like half of you wants to believe that, that well, that was a legitimate misinterpretation, that was a legitimate error, and then half of you goes, well, isn't it funny that it happens just at the right moment? So this person is always nearly successful in delivering sort of the coup de grace, but didn't quite connect. Yet the other person is extremely agitated, seems to have all these tics that, that disrupt the delivery, but is saved from having to confront his, his you know, inner self, if you would. That's how bad they can get. Now, um, not only can they get bad for you, but they obviously, like, like any sort of mental imbalance, they, they will harm those around you. And God forbid if they happen to be concepts that, uh, given your relative position in society, that might influence you, say, in uh, generating or supporting specific uh, you know, policy or, or law in, uh, in that society. Because all of a sudden, that which is just uh, an experimental method of ruining your life becomes a complete um, and utter, you know, devastating rule for everyone to follow. So, from that perspective, you can look at these uh, concepts, not, not just the negative ones, but all concepts. You can think of them, again, like pathogens, uh, with disease vectors and with immunities. Um, for example, since we've invented writing, um, the printing press, television, radio, telephone, and now the internet, our mediums of transmission have grown, grown vastly. You know, we have a myriad of mediums. We have a, a reach beyond belief. You, know, you can get a, a thought, a meme, an idea across the universe or across the, 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 the planet almost instantly. So the transmissibility of, uh, of these pathogens is humongous. And of course, they have their own uh, sort of immunity. So depending on how complex uh, certain concepts are, there's already arguments already been, you know, they, they've already matured. They've already had to face a variety of disagreements, a variety of uh, uh, opposition. So some of them are pretty pernicious. They, they'll hold on and, uh, and, and continue to damage. So let's keep walking. Um, <coughs> concepts also... They're basically ways to summarize a wide range of experience. And I, they have this property that I, I kind of think of them as, um, think of them as strange atoms. Because they're, they're not like atoms the way we, we understand them. They're not, you know, of a similar size. Because they, they have this amazing flexibility and adaptability and, a, and sort of an accommodating aspect. Because they can stretch as large or, as, or they can go as small as you require. Because they can summarize, you know, huge experiences, complex experiences. They can describe objects. They can describe patterns, methods, feelings. So as you can see, there's no given size there. They can contain other concepts. They can be very fragmentary. Um, so they're sort of any and all sizes. But they're still concepts. And they're still sort of the composite blocks. Um, the, the traditional sort of uh, journalism questions, the what, the how, the when, the why, the where, the who of, of a story, of, a, of an event. They, th each one of these is in itself a concept. They're basically both structure and content and process. They can be very rigid. They can be very precise. They can signal the limits of something, you know, so they can be very 
very much like you know here's the square peg you can you cannot put a you know you cannot put it in a round hole kind of very very rigid if you have that type of discipline um but because we we, we require fast processing we also learn this other set of concepts called heuristics shortcuts shortcuts are what we use to get by in the vast majority of our interactions they tend to be they tend to be very simplistic as we're young and uh, they tend to get very sophisticated uh, as we as we grow and learn more and of course education is where we first encounter our most uh, our first set of sophisticated heuristics um, because that's that's the environment where we begin to get built um, you might be fortunate you might have been uh, raised in a family of intellectuals with uh, with an emphasis on you know reading books often and intellectual discussion at the dinner table you may um, but for the vast majority of people um, it's really once you enter formal education, so, you know, from, uh, from public school to um, through middle school, you know, high school, etc., all the way to, for, for the more fortunate, higher education, such as college or, uh, or university, um, that's the environment where you're isolated. It is, it's, it's created in such a way to foster uh, an atmosphere of intellectual curiosity. And it's basically where you start getting exposed to intellectual patterns and intellectual um, concepts and the diversity of them. Now, educators are part of this environment. They're actually the integral part of this environment because think of them as the authors of this environment. They, they literally create this environment for you. Uh, before you even become part of this, it's already, the educators have already decided, they've pre-selected the material you're going to see, uh, the topics, the way, the way in which it was going to be presented to you, the, the, the path by which they'll take you to expose you to it. So there's a process already predefined, there's material already predefined, and then they uh, step in as the guides, the, the, the key mentors, and then their, their job is to basically expose you um, to such uh, patterns, explain them to you, contextualize them to, uh, for you, uh, answer questions, and in effect, basically um, make them sufficiently interesting and sufficiently memorable that you retain them. Now, obviously, it requires that they're skilled at this. Obviously, bad, bad teachers are a problem because you, you, you know, they won't be able to generate the same level of. Uh, uh, of attraction to these concepts uh, as some others, and therefore your education, your formative uh, process will suffer. But uh, as you move into higher ed, as you move into university, as you move into uh, college, uh, a position of a professor, for example, that tends to imply, and, and we, all, we all agree generally, that that position implies some level of expertise, and it implies that a certain level of trustworthiness. Um, and that's, that's really key here because, I mean, at, from one perspective, it's probably one of the most sacred duties of, uh, of a professor, uh, this, this, you know, him taking serious the job he has, because if you think about it, it's, it's a young person's most formative time. I mean, this is when you're exposed to the diversity of intellectual knowledge out there, all the authors and the ideas that history has provided all the way to us. And uh, this is when you begin to build your affinities. You know, this is when you decide that I think more this way, I think more that way. I mean, a person has certain genetic traits that predispose them to be, let's say, more creative, more analytical, more whatever. Um, a variety of studies predict to a certain extent, whether or not you're likely to be conservative, whether you're likely to be liberal. Um, aging tends to skew you away from liberalism into conservatism, but, but all of those are basically markers for the road. But the, the amount of, the, the, the distance you travel on those roads really depends on your personality. So it is these times that actually build you and reinforce the aspects of your intellectual persona um, that you'll later on take through life. Um, and this is where the problem arises, because as you might imagine, 
schooling is definitely a target of influence. So if, for example, you are, let's say, an enemy of a given country or of a given philosophy or of a given lifestyle, of a given set of people, it would occur to you that being able to sabotage, to, 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 to infiltrate education, you could actually get at, uh, at the minds of a vast portion of society. And, you know, if you were pernicious, if you were malicious about it, you could wreak some serious damage. But let's take away the conspiracy theories. More importantly, if you have inept or incompetent professors, those could really impact your society because they, they could impact like a whole generation of, of, of new thinkers. Increasingly, if you have misguided professors, where they might, have occur, uh, they might have incurred a set of beliefs that they believe they themselves are fully convinced of, but nevertheless, they're misguided. Um, they're incorrect. They're, they're, they're negative. If they choose, instead of being uh, aligned with what the, the ethos of the profession is, to be balanced and to be uh, all-inclusive, if they decide to be exclusive, to only focus on a specific area, to only reinforce that which they believe, their doctrine, their dogma, their bias, then you've got a problem. Because then you've got a whole generation of people that's, that are getting a very, very limited, um, skewed, and perhaps even, um, I don't know, uh, a very resentful view of, of certain aspects of society because they're, they're carrying this, this, this set of, this, the baggage of the professor into their own uh, knowledge. And because of the environment and because of the assumptions around the position, they would have never have even contemplated the concept of being manipulated. They'll simply believe that to be true, that to be reflective of the world. And now you've got a whole... Padre of people that feels the same imbalance of the world that, that the professor feels with the, the same or more passion, the same or more pathos, because they've been convinced, even though they've not actually empirically validated that, they, they, they have no reason to doubt it, they have no reason to not trust it. So, so there's my first signal around critical theory, is that you see too many very firmly, very, very comfortably uh, advertising professors that, that very, you know, without a compunction, they advertise Marxism, Antifa, whatever, any sort of, uh, sort of reactionary element of society, they think nothing about putting that descriptor of themselves on their public website, on their curriculum, and you have increasingly a large number of colleges that actually encourage that. So a professor that sends you out to do activism work, that isn't what a professor is supposed to do, because that is already taking a side. And the whole job of the professor was to, to lead you to the water, not to, to lead you to this side of the water. So, to continue. So, ever since Greek times, this has been our number one preoccupation. As we sort of woke up to this concept of uh, this, this enterprise of the, no, the knowledge of the world, as we realize we're thinking animals and we can start jotting things down and, and build upon knowledge, the number one thing that we've had to contend with is how the hell do we teach the next generation? How do we teach them to think? How do we teach them to, how do we pass on that which we've already figured out? We continue this enterprise of moving forward. And um, the first set of answers, and it was actually a pretty sophisticated answer, came to us from the Greeks. And uh, in all fairness, the, the structure that they used, in large part, has been transmitted down the thousands of years all the way to us, and pretty much unchanged. I mean, in, in principle. It has changed in detail, obviously, because we've learned much more. But uh, the structure, the sentiment, the spirit, it's all there. Um, 
what we call liberal arts is basically a direct transposition from uh, from the Greek come Roman, because uh, you'll notice by the names, the trivium and the quadrivium, those are Latin names. Those are the Roman translations of the Greek terms. Um, but the way education was structured then was the trivium was supposed to be your introduction to thought, to um, introduction to the logos. Uh, logos, roughly translated as the word, the spoken word, the spoken true word, um, you learned three things about word. Um, grammar, how words work, how to conjugate, how to change the structure of a word depending on where it's placed, and if you need it to be plural, or, or if you need to uh, understand the tense, the uh, gerund, it's the grammar aspects of the word. So how words work almost mechanically. Logic elevated you to either um, you can think of it as maybe uh, how words work in a sentence, or you could really think of it as how words begin to express. And, the, uh, and logic is really more around absorbing knowledge. So knowledge being delivered to you, being able to interpret it, being able to sort of take the sentence and turn it on its side and examine it for soundness and examine if uh, propositions are correctly uh, structured, if, uh, if a given um, assertion and a derivation prove each other. So if I, you know, if does one, if I give a reason for something, do they fit logically, things of that nature. So you learned words, you learned sentences and how to, uh, how to receive them and how to gauge their validity. And then in rhetoric, um, you step even further back and you learn context. So by then, it implies a certain vocabulary, a certain richness of vocabulary. A certain facility with construct or selecting words, being able to use the, the precise words, crafting the sentences, and then the purpose of rhetoric is to convince, to orate, to be able to conduct a dialogue in such a way that you can make a compelling uh, argument for whatever it is that issue you are arguing. So the expectation out of the trivium is that upon complish, completion you would be a somewhat functional orator. You would be able to interact with another person in a clear, crisp, convincing way. The quadrivium isn't as, uh, as pertinent to this discussion, but just for the sake of completeness, I'll just rapidly go through it. Uh, arithmetic was the same introduction as grammar, but to numbers. Um, geometry was numbers in space. Music was numbers in time. And astronomy was numbers in space and in time, specifically celestial mechanics. Um, I won't go through all the detail of that, but you get the idea. So, these things packed together were named the liberal arts. And the reason the word liberal, um, it was to basically identify them as in being more open, more free, than the other arts, the more strict arts, the more hard uh, arts. They weren't arts. They were basically the, the type of uh, education you received when you were looking for a specific trade. So, think this is not, you know, this is back in, say, feudal times, um, if you happen to be at least wealthy enough to afford any kind of education, right, if you are, let's say, middle class or uh, in, any way, in any way not completely uh, poor, you would typically send your son to some sort of trade school, some sort of guild, some sort of uh, apprenticeship, and the learning he would get would be very focused, very specific. And the goal of it was at the end of it, you would be a bricklayer, a mason, a leathersmith, a blacksmith, whatever. On the other side, you had this curriculum that, at the end of which, grammar and logic and rhetoric and arithmetic, at the end of which you had no specific skill, no, no exact skill, no, no given skill, but rather it would leave you to be an open thinker, a, a flexible, deep thinker. You would be cultured, you would have learned, you would have been exposed to many authors and writers and history and things of that nature. So you would have a well-rounded education, but not a very focused, not a very specific one as it come uh, from the perspective of learning a trade. So while you would be a, um, an intelligent conversationalist, you wouldn't be a very good bricklayer. So as you might imagine, you have to have some pretty decent amount of wealth and, and uh, um, and liberty uh, and time in your hands to be able to afford for your son or daughter 
to just kind of go away for some un, you know undisclosed period of the time and just study for no particular end goal. That was left to that was dedicated to mostly the aristocracy and the nobility of the time, and it was usually considered a requirement for you to enter society that you receive a liberal education. And of course, there was quite a bit of value to that because it refined some of your thinking. It allowed you to um, to be a little bit more perceptive as to another person's um, means of thinking. Um, because of history, you, you learned strategy, you learned a variety of things that might uh, manifest themselves if, God forbid, you have to lead an army to war, things of that nature. But again, this was the type of education that could only be given if you had some Boku cash. So, at the same time as this was both, on, from one perspective, kind of considered not useful because it didn't teach you something, and then, and then from another perspective, very useful because... Look, all the nobility and aristocrats definitely got some use out of it. Um, as more en enlightened rulers and governments sort of manifested, as we progress down the path of, of uh, becoming better people, um, various governments decided that, well, you know, some elements of this liberal education need to go to everybody. And then the, the concept of public schools showed up. Now, granted, they couldn't give a full liberal education a liberal arts education to everyone because that took quite a bit of time and uh, even though you might you know even though the the king or the the state government or whatever might be generous they, they they had a limit to the generosity so there was some level of some amount of time in which you could study um and then the expectation was that after a certain point you would typically go into the workforce or into the whatever uh, vocational uh, area you were going to pick so um, the process was to look at liberal arts and extract sort of the essentials out of it and simplify them down so you can fit them in the um, um, in the public schools in in the in the lower grades. So it, down to nearly middle school, you began to start getting exposed to some of these concepts, and those were pretty universal for a while. I'm t I'm beginning to talk about the timing of let's say, the 1800s on. Because, um, as you'll see, uh, there's also been a sort of decay after a certain period. So, the way they extracted liberal arts is um, they, they separated out things like teaching you language and teaching you math, the arithmetic and all that stuff. Those were the true basics. And then this other more esoteric piece, the, the, the logic, the thinking part, um, was isolated out, and its most basic components was kind of coupled into this thing that we call critical thinking. And critical thinking, I'll, I'll go into detail uh, on what that is in a second, but suffice it to say, that was packaged along with some basic, let's say, basic skills on how to be a proper citizen of a state, like how laws work, how the government roughly works, what, civic, what, what public ethics are maybe a bit of history and uh, some exposure to, to so sociology or social theory, very very light. Those would be all packaged together in a in a in a class called civics. And uh, civics, you got a little bit of exposure to it already in middle school. Then you got most of it in high school, and then you either went into your vocational training or your job or whatever. And if you believed that somehow logic or that that area interested you. You completed that education by going to higher ed, college, university, etc. Or, you know, seminary in the case of religion. So, the strange thing was that even though this was introduced and this was valuable and this caused a lot of, uh, uh, this created a lot of uh, better thinking uh, members of the populace, it slowly began to erode, and as the uh, as the sort of ruling class, if you would, the the makers of society, began to get more and more involved with sponsoring education, creating you know, Rhodes Scholar Prize, things of that nature. They began to influence the curriculum, and for some strange reason, civics sort of got withdrawn little by little. Uh, it was gone from middle school. It was gone from you know ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade. Pretty soon it dropped completely out of high school. And the expectation was, well, you know, if you really needed logic 
or rhetoric, you would get it in college. You know, it was going to be one of the core, one of the rec, uh, one of the requirements required classes. But even there, it started sort of disappearing because, well, I'm uh, I'm in my late forties, and I remember my college times. It was already logic was already sectioned. So if I, as I went into more engineering type things and mathematical oriented things, discrete logic was separated out. Um, philosophy and logic uh, was the exposure to philosophers and, and schools of thought. And the curriculum then sort of spanned Socrates to Sartre. Uh, it was a rapid fire view of all of the evolution of thought. But logic was discretized for a specific area. If you went into jurisprudence, like law, there was a much, much more emphasis on rhetoric and structural uh, construction, all that stuff. And then if you went into math, there was uh, the mathematical discipline of logic, you know, if P, then Q, that sort of uh, thing. But increasingly, as a, as a true requirement in most classes, if you wanted to be just, say, a writer, or if you wanted to get a, a, a BS in communication, or God forbid, you got one of those, like, fancy... Uh, sociology degrees incidentally I'm saying that humorously um, the prevailing zeitgeist of my era granted I'm dating myself but I remember at the time sort of sitting around shooting the, the bull with uh, my friends as we left col uh, as we left high school and enrolled in college and deciding what the hell to pursue and the general feeling was that if you wanted to just sort of party and kind of slack you went for sociology because that wasn't, you know, that was kind of the, you didn't need to know, know too much. You didn't need to study too much. You just kind of went to a bunch of classes and nodded your head. That was the feeling then. I can only imagine what it is now. Now, sociology, at, my, at least in my time, was sort of, it was, there was a very dismissive attitude towards it. Like, it's not even a real science. Even psychology was sort of, yeah, it's kind of a science, but not really. Um, nothing compared to, say, physics, math, you know, the empiricals. The, the attitude towards that wasn't informed um, with today's view, because this was before having the vast amount of administration in the college, for example. There was, there was before you had a specific, before HR had to do with teaching you how to uh, promote diversity and, uh, and ensure, you know, gender equality and things of that nature. None of the social justice elements existed in, the, in those times. They were simply, you know, how to understand society. Even though the, the philosophy had already entered the schools. But uh, now, if you look at sort of that area, the sociology area or the um, literary areas, I mean, there, there's been an explosion in the, the, the subgenres there. And we'll get into why that's critical. So little by little, this core aspect of logic and of thinking started getting replaced from critical thinking to critical theory. And little by little, you didn't get exposed to all of the dead white philosophers, but you got exposed mostly to the new modern ones, and increasingly less of them. But pretty soon, it became possible to study literature without ever encountering Shakespeare became possible to, to study some aspects of philosophy without ever encountering anybody before Marx, uh, if that, and maybe even go straight into postmodernism. So the foundational elements of it, little by little, unless you search, I mean, they still exist. You have to search them out in terms of following the, you know, finding the class. If you simply followed the structural requirements, just you looked at your little syllabus and you said you needed class 103C, well, then that, that's what you took. You had to know that something else was there, and you had to go ferret for it. It wasn't visible. So that's the situation that brings us into modern day, so to speak. Um, now we have a whole slew of graduates, postgraduates, and that, that, that lack a certain aspect of, of education. So let's leave that as problem one. But now let's look at critical theory, its origins, and then see what that specifically, when contrasted with critical thinking, how does that differ? So for fir first to do that, let's look at critical thinking. What the hell is that? So uh, in simplest terms, it was our answer to the eternal question of how to think. It was our answer until recently. 
Um, it's simplest definition. I pulled it off of dictionary.com. It's disciplined thinking that is clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence. Seems pretty straightforward. It's, it's a little simplistic because there is a lot more to that. But it functions. You get the idea. It's engaging in rational in a rational process. Um, from a career website, uh, giving you tips on how to interview for specific desired skills, how to, you know, why is critical thinking important? So this is, think of it as the more educated yet still garden variety definition. Um, critical thinking is the ability to analyze information objectively and make a reasoned judgment, and similar to the first one. It's also, you can think of it as the evaluation of sources, such as data, facts, observable, observable phenomenon, and research findings. So it, again, it, it re-emphasizes that whole concept of having to gather information, facts, data, supporting evidence. Um, good critical thinkers can draw reasonable conclusions from a set of information and discriminate between useful and less useful details to solve a problem or make a decision. Seems pretty straightforward, right? These are the people that are going to have to make a decision, so they have to figure out what the hell's better and what the hell's worse. If you go to Wikipedia, and granted, Wikipedia has its own slant. I mean, it tends to be far more, let's say, left, liberal, Marxist kind of... Uh, it has a little... Uh, it tends to go that side of the house, but still, um, they're, 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 they begin to give you the true sense of it. It's a lot more strict is the analysis of facts to form a judgment, okay, the rational, skeptical, unbiased analysis or evaluation of factual evidence. So again, very much focused on data, facts, reality, truth. Um, critical thinking is, and this is the key part, is self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, self-corrective thinking. So think of it as almost an, an inner monologue, your inner loop running, investigating your concepts. It's self-directed. You make it search out what it needs to look at. It's self-disciplined. You invoke it periodically and repeatedly and without fail. It's self-monitored. You make sure that you've done it. You, you examine it. You score it, etc. And it's self-corrective. You, when you identify the flaws, you then seek out the right answers. Now imagine how much of that is missing from our current thinking. Uh, to continue, it presupposes, and this is uh, this gets a little bit more. It presupposes assent to rigorous standards of excellence and mindful command of their use. So it assumes you've already risen to a given standard. You, you already got good at stand uh, at a at a standard of excellence, meaning um, you can understand what proper application is what good application is was very good application is so you can understand and be nuanced about the um the level of accuracy the level of truth the level of reasonability of something so you're not fooled by let's say uh the typical fallacies the argumentum ad you know uh, all of the various tricks of debate things of that nature so you've already un understood those rigors um and you're mindful um, when you command their use. You, you, you pay attention when you apply them. And it entails effective communication and problem-solving abilities, as well as, and this is where you start seeing the critical theory influence, as well as a commitment to overcome native egocentrism and sociocentrism. And this is somewhat fair. I mean, things are interpreted from your view, so you're mindful of that. Therefore, you're mindful that you might have biases, and you're mindful that the society you come from also has surrounding biases, so you attempt to remove those from your normal thinking to identify that neutral that neutrality state that it seeks. Um, where does it come from? So, as I said, Socrates, Greeks. Um, all of this, when we say critical thinking, uh, you might hear a bit re uh, referred to as Socratic dialogue, Socratic questioning, Socratic method. Um, Socrates. We've learned from uh, Plato's writings. Socrates, just as an aside, that's sort of like the atheists or the intellectuals, Jesus. Because much like uh, Jesus, he's, he's only referenced in canon. He's only ever referenced in uh, Plato's works. We don't have any sort of uh, um, contemporary historical writings. We just have writings of, uh, I think, Plato and 
I think he's referenced in others, but typically it's actually referenced about Plato and Socrates. So, so there is a possibility that he's that is completely uh, f uh, fictitious. We we all like to believe he existed, but he may not. Much like Jesus. Um, Socrates, in most of Plato's writing that refers to Socrates, you'll find him typically engaged in dialogue and questioning and and posing those deep questions to others and in eliciting a response. Um, and the dialogue is deep. You know, it's 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 often it's it's interesting to read, but I doubt you could ever you know. <laughs> You could ever go through life being that goddamn inquisitive to everybody you meet. Maybe it was more fashionable then, but, you know, at some point people will stop inviting you to parties. Um, but in any case, Socrates established the idea that we can't depend upon those in quote-unquote authority to have sound knowledge and insight. We, they simply won't. He demonstrated that people that may have the power in high position and yet be very confused and irrational about their thinking. He established the importance of asking deep questions that probe profoundly into thinking before we accept ideas uh, and before we give them this, this, this worthiness of belief. His method of questioning is the, so the Socratic questioning, and it's, um, and it's the best known critical thinking teaching strategy. In his mode of questions, Socrates highlighted the need for thinking for clarity and logical consistency, asked people questions to reveal the irrational thinking or lack of reliable knowledge. Socrates demonstrated that having authority does not ensure accurate knowledge. So, to explain the Greek method, the, the Socratic method, um, and, and with it, it's, it's, there's also a systemic sort of method of teaching it. Um, the Socratic circles were these structures by which you would have a person, uh, let's say the, the, the holder of the idea, the holder of the thesis, that was called the thesis, and he would, po you know, he would uh, speak it to, to the class or to, the, to his, depending on, sometimes you would have one opponent, multiple opponents, you could have even people on your side. It, it, would, uh, it tended to vary in terms of how many players and, and, and how often, but fundamentally the main structure was, here's the guy at the center that has the idea, the thesis, then there's the opponent, the interlocutor. And the interlocutor, upon hearing the thesis, would pose an elenchus. Elenchus, or elenchai in, um, in plural, was the counter statement, the testing statement, the, the statement of dissent, the cross-examination, the, um, the way you attacked the, the premise. And you could attack it if it happened to be something where you could naturally see, that if it had a natural opposite, you would pose that, and then you would give support for that. But many times things don't have a natural opposite, so it might be a cooperative opposite, or a, or an orthogonal, or a tangential, or a whatever. So you would begin to attack this issue in various ways. You could attempt to make, a, you know, a, an induction statement, a deduction statement. You know, well, if this was true, then it would mean that would be true, and and of course that would be illogical. Therefore, you're, you know, how could you explain that? That sort of thing. Uh, you could do a um, a reduction at absurdum. You could say, well, if that, you know, if you're saying $50 is a good way to do it, well, why not spend all of your money on that? And then what do you have? That kind of thing. And there were certain methods of engagement that were valid. There were certain methods that were basically tricks. And um, that's what you learned. What, how to engage in that dialogue. How to, how to identify proper and sound arguments. How to defend against those. And... This is the key part. The process, think of it as smaller truths falling away to reveal the bigger truth. Much like a sculptor chips away at the marble to reveal the, the, the masterpiece inside. This was a process by which you saw how ephemeral certain truths, certain arguments could be. How seemingly strong and then collapse. But at no point did you ever get to the ground validation truth you might be very good your 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 or your thesis might be very strong you might be able to defend it valiantly against all comers but it still left the open idea that the next argument could come and destroy it so truth basically was a process if you actually experienced a very a very destructive attack that it left you unable to respond because you no longer had a proper response, 
That wasn't a defeat necessarily, that was reaching a state of aporia. Being in a state of aporia was the goal. Aporia was the state of puzzlement, the state that basically, you know, the, the, the famous pose of the thinker with, with one hand under his chin. It left you thinking about the truth. It made you go away and have to reassess. It made you realize that there was depth there that you hadn't plumbed before. And that was the process. Now, there's a lot of varieties in this because, as I said, it could be, it could have multiple players. You could have a circle basically on your side discussing the merits of your argument and then discussing the juxtaposition of the counter arguments, uh, you know, identifying sort of the play by play of how you argue, not just the argument. They would judge you on your logos, your, your mastery of the word, your pathos, the passion, your ethos, the um, basically the knowledge, the general, you know, um, functional knowledge that you had and, uh, and your respect of the process. So there were elements, dimensions, and there were dimensions upon dimensions to this process. Let's leave it at that. So as you can see, it isn't, although it's simple, it is also complex. But in its core, it emphasized rational thought. It literally can get boiled down to math. So if you've been exposed to this, you can actually write down most logical problems in a notation, like if P, then Q. If not P, then not Q. That kind of thing. So there is a rigidity and empiricism to this, as well as a poetry to this, the, the idea of the infinite dialogue. Um, and let's go just a little bit deeper before we, we jump off from thinking to theory. Where does this word critical come from? So obviously it's Greek. The, the root is kritikos. Kritikos is itself a composite. It comes from uh, the adjective, which comes from a verb, but krinen which is to separate, to choose, to decide, to, to sort, to basically to triage. Uh, the kritos would be those things that are separated, picked out, you know, separated, uh, triaged. And the kritikos were the ones who did the sorting, the discerning, the choosing, the judging. Now, notice that nowhere here is there an, an implication of good or bad, of, of being positive or of being negative. So think of the word critic today, criticism. It has a certain nuance to it. Critique back in the day was an analysis. A criticism was an attack, an attack that almost implied a, a negative connotation, a, uh, a public humiliation. A, a, you know, if you have a critic, it's someone who disagrees with you vehemently and it has a certain making you feel bad, an invalidation connotation. So in many respects, the idea of invalidation was a lot more desirable in ages past than it is today because you sought out to be invalidated. You often hear that, you know, a scientist... Uh, you know, lives to be proven wrong. And you kind of snicker at it and go, yeah, 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 because you know, when you're proven wrong, it's embarrassing. It's, it's awful. But that's a societal thing that we have now. Because the idea is that in philosophy, in science, in math, in all of these things, wherever there is a theory, it is your hope that the theory is right. But if it isn't, and someone can prove it wrong, First and foremost, the most important thing is that it has been proven wrong. The fact that you might be embarrassed because it, it accounted for some piece of your identity or, or, you know, gee gosh, you worked on this for a long time. That may be just the unfortunate side effect. But the critical, the important piece of this is that it actually, by being proven wrong, it actually gave you more knowledge. Because now it gave you the, the knowledge that this is invalid, then there's further work to be done. Right? But we've lost track of that piece. And it is the criticism, as it began to incur this sort of negative thing, that we now started employing criticism not as a method of analysis, but as a method of invalidation. Um, now, so in closing with just critical thinking, you can think of critical thinking as your default perception algorithm. It got installed in you through your education. It was reinforced by your parents, your grandparents, or you know, everybody that you've known generationally has had some portion of this algorithm, depending on how much education they had, 
installed in their brains and you got it installed in yours. Until now. Because not all of us now walking around, depending on what generation you are, may have this specific algorithm because there's been a new sort of neural network algorithm, some machine learning thing that unfortunately isn't as clear cut in its provenance as this one and it might have some errors in there. So, you know, maybe you're, like, think of it as a face recognition algorithm that all of a sudden can't recognize, like, five key faces, and they just happen to be the important ones in your life. That's a problem. So what is... We got to critical thinking, now let's get to theory. Now, you might be inclined to think that if it's a theory, much like, say, you know, all theories in mathematics, it has some sort of uh, hypothesis and some method of, you know, some proofs, and then a conclusion and a proof. No. It's a theory that actually seems to survive the fact that it can be invalidated repeatedly. As you might know from other sciences, the empirical sciences, uh, any theory that you create what used to be the role of the, what was called natural philosopher, before we had name for physicists and scientists and all that, was that you would, like, so, for example, Newton, you would observe something like gravity, and then you'd start doing a whole bunch of uh, experiments once you've identified the general theory you're trying to prove. So, as he was trying to prove, you know, F equals MA, for example, force equals mass times acceleration, then he would take a ball, get, you know, lay out some clay, flatten it out, and then Spend the ball at a certain height, drop it from that height, then change the height, drop it from that height, and record sort of the depth of the gate of the gouge the, that the hard ball would leave in the soft clay, that kind of thing. And then he would, you know, methodically write these numbers and repeat the experiment, and begin to mathematically identify the performance of that theory. And he would articulate the theory. He would articulate his proofs. He would articulate the conclusions. And then based on that concept, that, that concept that he then recorded, another scientist could, could simply take that and then devise his own different experiments, make an intelligent prediction based on that theory, and then when conducting the experiment, if the results happened as the theory, as calculated by the theory prior to running them, then the predictions met the experiment results. And if those two were sufficiently close, sufficiently identical, because, you know, you can only measure within so much precision, if they were reasonably the same, then you could say you then proved the theory. And the theory stopped being um, a theory, and it moved into a law, if it had been for, you know, if it had been proven repeatedly by everyone, and it had not yet been invalidated, right? So some of the basic laws of mechanics, some of the basic laws of thermodynamics, physics, etc., they are now laws because they started as theories, went through experimental and theoretical um, prediction, met experimental prediction, met experimental operation, application, and then they became laws. With critical theory, it's more observational. And uh, it just implies that, yes, this condition exists in the world, tends to fail on that whole showing you the work part of math. So let's start. If you juxtapose critical thinking, I left the definition here just so we have it, there is a certain operational aspect to it, and it's somewhat defined and rigid, somewhat. Um, the way critical theory began, it started with critical philosophy, which was something that was introduced in the mid-1800s by Immanuel Kant, um, then, and his, his philosophy was sometimes called transcend, transcendental idealism, or in any case, his, uh, I don't want to say disciple, but the very next generation of, of philosopher that basically inherited for, uh, some of Kant's ideas and then promulgated further was Hegel. And, uh, under him it was called critical idealism. Then Marx got a hold of it, completely took it a different way, said so dialectical materialism, and then eventually, you know, you get to Horkheimer and, and sort of the new left and the Frankfurt School, and then it begins to come out as critical theory. 
But let's walk through each component. First of all, the um, just to put a, the word dialectic aside and why you know why it departed from critical, the critical thinking method, that that uh, enclenctic method, the Elenki and the Aporia, that could be applied in two ways: one dialectic, one analytic. Analytic means you're on your own. You ask yourself that you know you have your own supposition, your own test, your own idea. You are the ones that you're the one that will now ask the counter question and validate it. So you're interlocutor and the uh, proponent of the idea at the same time. A dialectic is a dialogue. It's presenting two parties and and allowing that dialogue. It isn't having a third party looking at history of the two parties and analyzing it the way it gets completely reinterpreted as we're about to see. Um, Kant was born in a time where there was a very, there was a great deal of unrest in, uh, in Europe, but you know, it had been a century of unrest. Um, this was the tail end of the age of enlightenment, age of reason. The printing press was out for a while. It had caused havoc all through Europe because Obviously, as you might uh, recall from your history, it, uh, Martin Luther and the whole Protestant uh, movement, it allowed the questioning of religion. And it's important to remember that up to this, this age, and very much for the next hundred years, even from Kant, religion is still the bedrock of all activity for all of, Western, uh, of the Western civilization. Despite the fact that for the last a hundred years, I mean, going back to, say, Renaissance, all the way through uh, Enlightenment, increasingly science made little progress and then started progressing a lot, and then all of a sudden you had the age of reason, where science all of a sudden started getting very sophisticated and started providing better explanations for the natural world than the Bible did. And that was a tipping point. Because until that point, the Bible was the place the only place, the place, the, the authority on everything. Now, mind you, it was the authority, even though the vast majority of the world couldn't read it. It wasn't even translated in the, in the Vulgate or in English for, you know, thousands of years since its inception. So you mostly relied on your priest to tell you what it said. So obviously, you know, the, the explanations would tend to range, um, and they would typically be satisfactory. But again, the... There was always this sense of, you know, you're operating within the religious. And then, as science began to displace more and more and more of what used to be religion's role, for the intellectuals, for the philosophers, for the, you know, the smarty pants of the world, the question began of, well, this thing now has primacy over religion in, you know, conceptually all areas. And even though you chose not to look, you know, you didn't operate science against the specific, the theosophic, the, the, the religious, religious pieces, you know, um, if you applied it to science and to, to ethics and to morality, morality, well, morality comes from God, doesn't it? Ooh. So now there was this underlying, pro this underlying premise, promise, premise, whichever we want to think of it, 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 it seemed logical, it seemed apparent, it seemed almost immediate that there should be a rational grounding for morality not one that came from God. Because increasingly, almost everything, even celestial goddamn dynamics were being grounded in science. The movement of the stars. Well, if those are, then definitely, you know, morality. So Kant was amongst the, the many who attempted his own, you know, method of getting to what ought to be. Um, the way Hume said, you know, try to find the what ought from the what is. Um, and uh, he had a, and this is where you begin to see the beginning, the beginning breaks in logic and, and the, the introductions. Even though they're subtle, there's this introduction of the fallacies that are going to just amplify and careen out from, from this seed of, of pernicious sort of decay. So first and foremost, he decides, like as I said, it doesn't show his work, he just asserts that the primary task of philosophy is as criticism rather than justification of knowledge. And it's interesting, the juxtaposition of words, because justification, right, you would think that implies taking aside. And then criticism in its, in its traditional sense would have been an analysis of. But in his use, it's actually reversed, right? It's the criticism, because 
It is the philosopher's primary task to make the world better. Well, to make the world better, you, you kind of tacitly assume that it's bad. Something's bad. You make it better. And, and, and even though it's slight and it's subtle and it's almost, you know, incidental, it begins. Um, he further, I mean, I didn't put all of, you know, obviously you can't fit all of Hegel in two lines, but um, there's an element of cultural relativism. There's an element of sort of pre-context supposition, a lensing. Uh, cultural relativism, uh, it, this is another concept that got borrowed from physics poorly. Relativism means that depending on your, the point of location, you have a specific perspective to that which you are measuring. You know, there's an angle to the way you're trying to measure. And if you were to shift to another point, you would have a different perspective. And once you add motion and inertia, if you're actually from one point of movement to another point of movement, then you have two frames of reference. And therefore, the, the measurements may be different. This is as far as the philosopher, this is where philosophers stop, right? They don't continue to read the fine print on that theory because that, that gets into like Lorenzian transformation and math and heavy stuff. But where relativism continues is that even though when you shift perspectives, you may have a different measurement, be aware that it is different, but there is a transformation formula that you should apply to normalize them, to make them the same. That part gets left out. Relativism in philosophy is that, well, depending on your point of view, your truth, your measurement, your reality is different than another point of truth. And then, here's how, how philosophy conjugates this, and since there's an infinite number of possible perspectives, who are you to privilege your particular perspective over any other? So notice how you now have jumped the shark in thinking. Because now, if, well, if my truth is just one of infinite number of all different truths, well, obviously, mine has no value. And therefore, none of them have any value because it completely skips this, ob this idea of objective truth. This idea that no matter which truth you take, once you applied the Lorentzian to it, the, the transformation to it, it would be the same answer across the board, period, always, fixed, decided, objective. That part's left out. So you get cultural relativism, which is the first little infringement on this area, which is, no, two cultures are, you know, two cultures are very different. Therefore, they generate different morality. So... You can't judge this culture by your morality because it doesn't fit. It's not in the same frame of reference. That seems good. That seems fair. I mean, you can't take the Lorentzian from one point and apply it to another, right? It's, it's very different. Makes sense. Yet at the same time, while he invalidates, he basically, uh, in doing this, in, de in, in invalidating your perspective, which happens to actually be the perspective of a person from the same Western culture, in favor of some other indeterminate culture. Um, he also continues into this concept of the categorical imperative, which is like this, this implied super duty, this implied sacrament truth, sacrament uh, morality, some superior morality by which you should apply it because you're supposed to be that much more evolved in your morality that you should know not to apply X, you know, your cultural relative morality to uh, when looking at this. But again, you see that, that this is where you start seeing the concept of detachment because there is a weird kind of method he speaks to this in which this critic, uh, this categorische imperative, this categorical imperative, which he stumbled on, is meant to be the way you are motivated to not do the thing you would do, <laughs> which is apply your morality <laughs> to something. Therefore, this other morality, which you're somehow evolved to, is your morality now, which is supposed to stop you from applying the metrics of your morality <laughs> to a situation. So you get to see the absurdity in the self-referential loop here. And then he proceeds to say that, you know, the founts of knowledge, the historical, the, the, the texts and all that stuff that you have to study, um, and you might be familiar with the saying, to the victor, uh, or history is written by the victors. You get this sort of... Uh, pernicious thought sneaking in there to say, well, I mean, if the victors wrote it, maybe that wasn't the story. Maybe they lost. And they told us they won, but maybe they lost. Maybe they're lying. Well, I'm exaggerating with the saying, but the notion he introduces is that you must look at history with the lens of a certain um, 
he uses the categorical imperative again, with this superior learning that you have now, not with the morality of the time. So it might have looked right then, but you know better now. Therefore, apply this morality as a lens. One, completely invalid, right? You, you know, how could, how could you apply some future morality to a present action, for example? Two, your morality, however advanced you might assume it is, is sourced from many of those exact texts, the ones you're supposed to extract the criteria and toss and apply your new criteria, your new learned superior scintillating criteria to. But your criteria came is a composite of all of those texts that you are now supposed to somehow isolate content from, from criteria of morality. So I, I know I'm rambling on and on about this, but I think you're beginning to get the idea that, that, that some s slight cracks in the thinking weren't necessarily as visible as they should have been at that time. Now Kant is hands down one of the top philosophers of history. His writing style was crisp. He was very, very fluid, very, 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 very beautiful in his writing. So not a lot of uh, room for criticism. You really have to dig and understand. However, none, nevertheless, in his time, he was still accused of being obscurant. Obscurant is one who seeks to hide. That basically, again, the way I've explained it is not showing his work in the case of a math problem. You know how you used to turn in your, your math solution, and then if you didn't show how you arrived from the, the problem to the solution, then you didn't show your work and you got an F. Well, he does that, but he does that philosophically. And he, he flat out says, even though he was a trained mathematician, he says that, you know, philosophy isn't mathematics. Therefore, he completely kind of just dismisses mathematics or, or any r reliance upon it as not being pertinent to philosophy, which is categorically wrong. Now, but at least he was a crisp thinker, and most of his observations of the world were on the money. And his, you know, however, however uh, erroneous this piece of uh, logic that he introduced with critical philosophy and uh, cultural relativism and categorical imperative, however he introduced this, it was slight, and it was well-intended. It was, in a way motivational to be a better person, a more tolerant, a more, you know, like a improve the world kind of thing. And granted, I mean, in his time, there was plenty of issues. But equally, I mean, you could also see that if you were to compare, say, his time from, say, 200 years prior, there was vast improvement having been done. So that he loses. Now, in comes Hegel. Hegel, very big difference, because not only does he fully take on the obscurant aspects of Kant, He's got his own problems. His writing style is so tortured and complex and unnecessary and repeated. And, and he's got these little penchants for what I like to call the one hand clapping type sayings, right? The, the, the little deep, you know, seemingly deep sounding things, you know, from the beginning is the end kind of thing. You know, like, like these stupid things that say nothing. Uh, I haven't prepared any exact examples, but if you ever read Hegel, there'll be tons of these nicely symmetric oppositionally symmetric type statements. Loves those things. So he's, um, it, it's almost like what pop psychology is to psychology, Hegel is to the time of philosophy. But, 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 he's still considered one of the top philosophers now. It's important to see how philosophers were perceived by their peers at the time they lived. Because the majority of the philosophers during Hegel's time regarded Hegel as someone that shouldn't even be allowed to hold a teaching position. He was, like, they considered him not only wrong, but so goddamn wrong that he shouldn't be allowed near a school. And he had a vast number of critics, whereas, you know, Kant had some, Hegel had shitloads. And good, I mean, and the, the, the critics were still, you know, people that we consider, you know, fairly advanced in their thinking, Heine, Goethe, whatever. Um... So, eventually he did get a job, and he published a whole, and he published, eh, boy, did he publish, Phenomenology, he, he, he's the one that coined Geist, uh, spirit, so, Zeitgeist, spirit of the age, uh, Volkgeist, spirit of the people, and Weltgeist, the spirit of the world, um, as sort of the transitional, like, summary, uh, view of the world kind of thing, um, he looked at, you know, he kind of turned the, the, simple, the, the observation into phenomenology, like being able to mark events all of a sudden became like a whole um, set of terminologies. But this is what he took. He took the concepts from 
hunt, and then he had to take those cracks and widen them a little bit. He does this whole thing about the interaction of opposites, and uh, you might be familiar with the Hegelian dialectic. Conspiracy theorists like to throw that out there as a method of control, which is a complete misinterpretation yet again. But what his take is on the, the original dialectic, um, he sort of uh, begins to rigidize it, begins to restrict it to a context and forces a result. Which is completely just, you know, at that point, you're just, you, you literally have taken one case out of a possible thousand, million, whatever, out of the Socratic dialogue and decided to make that a complete theory. What he says is the thesis, as we talked about, the, the you know, the proponent idea, the thesis versus the antithesis, because he loves to have diametric opposites for everything. He sees the interaction of opposites of being the way that every single thing in the world has been birthed. Is untrue. Um, so the thesis appears on in the world, just unbidden, and then somehow the world responds via the antithesis, which is the diametrical opposite of the thesis, and then they do battle, and then out of that battle comes the synthesis, synthesis, the compromise basically of the two, and that becomes the new thesis. Now that just is is got a few fallacies in there, so let's dissect that one. It implies that every thesis has a natural opponent, right? The, a natural diametrically opposed view, which isn't true. You know, this is where, this is the trap you get into whenever you try to put someone on some spectrum that has, that, that lacks any nuance, right? So are you left or are you right? Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, well, are you conservative? Okay, I'm conservative. You're a racist. Wait, wait a minute. What, what, wait a minute. Conservative is one thing. Racist is another. There, that's another spectrum line. How, you, how are you blending these two lines? Right, so there's always an acceleration on a different vector that could be tangential, that could be orthogonal, that could be even you know, primarily cooperative, but just of a different uh, magnitude. So you can attack a given premise in a variety, it, literally not even a 360 angle, but a complete, however many angles in a sphere from the center, angle, right? A complete 3D angle of attack to a given point. So to say that there's always something that is of the same intensity as just the opposite vector is stupid because it, it, it literally privileges one point among infinity of what could be. Secondarily, he makes another rigidity in there, which is there is a synthesis. There is a compromise. There is a solution. Well, things can be in opposition for eternity and never see resolution, right? There could be partial resolution. It doesn't have to be compromised. One could basically, you know, steamroll the other. Um, so that dynamic of the interaction is lost, right? It always implies that there's some sort of compromisable synthetic solution that comes out. And, and on, one, on one perspective, you can take this theory and actually think of it as being valid, because it, it can be. That's the problem, is that when these theories are being brought onto the fore, they, the part of the work that they don't show is that it is a possibly, I mean, it is one theory that is possible. There's nothing wrong with the theory. It's just one of many, and the, part, the of many part they never show. So now this becomes the categorical singular, and then the next guy takes it over, Marx, and he decides to restrict it in his way. And all of a sudden, what is, you know, what is a singular instance of an infinite set then gets singular, then it itself becomes the infinite set, and then they pick a singular instance out of that. And it continues to get more and more rigid down the line. But what does Marx do? Marx decides that it's dialectical materialism. And this tells you quite a bit about Marx, because and I've got a separate video, well, several separate videos. I, I love to criticize Marx, but Marx was sort of one of these uh, ressentiment people that, you know, he was kind of always wanted money, didn't have it, and it was like the kid looking in through the window into the candy store and never could quite get his hands on the candy. So he's very resentful, like the guy, you know, that gets rejected by the chick and says, ah, she's ugly anyways, I don't want to see her. Well, he starts looking at the world, and another thing that Hegel did to introduce some more cracks is that he also introduced this context uh, of master-slave dynamic. So he also posited, like, because everything was an interaction of opposites, uh, all human interaction was really, no matter what the interaction was, familial, employment, whatever, whatever that relationship was, it was always one was a master, one was a slave. Okay? 
Kind of makes sense. One's stronger, one's weaker. Okay, maybe. Maybe there is a certain power dynamic in most relationships, along with many other dynamics. But wait, 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 because Hegel loves that, you know, that sort of travel the world and get back to the starting point kind of, you know, one hand clapping bullshit. Well, the master uh, basically needs observance, admiration, um, whatever. Some level of attention being paid. So the slave pays attention to the master. Okay, that's the relationship. But here's where it gets, it get, you know, here's where it blows your mind. And I say that very facetiously. The, the slave pays attention diligently to the master over a lengthy period till the point where the master begins to depend on the attention being paid to him by the slave. And then it is the master who requires, who needs the slave, and no longer does the slave need the master because the relationship now flipped and poof, your mind's blown. Not really. I mean, you kind of see like a whole bunch of other variations to that type of behavior that he just chooses to skip. But okay, he cements this idea, this master slave. So Marx sees that. And Marx was uh, basically when Marx went to school, he was supposed to be a lawyer and he sucked at it. But the one thing he actually was, you know, marginally good at because he got feedback on it was basically studying Hegel. So he decides that I'm going to be a Hegel philosophist writer thing. And uh, basically chooses to be a writer. Tries to push his thesis at University of Berlin. Doesn't work. They say, fuck you. You, you know, you suck, get out. Goes to Bonn. Doesn't work there. And eventually goes to like the Chico state of Germany, Jena. And at the University of Jena, he manages to get a degree. And then he can be a writer. That's kind of like a postmodernist, uh, you know, grievance degree today, being a barista. So he goes and writes. But, he, you know, he can't get a job at like real intelligent kind of, you know, deep thinking places, he gets a job at the, you know, younger sort of, uh, let's say, like the, the, the newsletter type rags of the time, the reactionaries. So he tends to write about communism and about like the dissatisfaction of the peoples, you know, the, the conspiracy theory people. And he gets some sort of traction there where he begins to use his Hegel that he's learned. So now he's looking really intelligent. Well, what does he decide that Hegel really means? Master, slave, you know, that's, that's sort of feudalistic verbiage. No, 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 it's capitalist and proletariat. Proletariat, which would be the worker. Because, you know, this thing called the Industrial Revolution just happened, and he's noticing it everywhere. Not that he wants to notice it too close. He never liked actually going into a factory and getting, you know, like that whole getting dirt on the fingernails thing, wasn't for him. He married, a, like, a aristocrat woman who had some money. His family had a little bit of money, even though he spent it. He spent his entire life in debt perpetually, even though he supposedly is a master economist, at least according to Marxist philosophers. Funny enough that uh, one of his first little snidey publications where he got a little bit of uh, uh, recognition for his, you know, him, him being sort of a Serbic witty, witticism, at least for that little group of retards he was playing with, there was a anarchist philosopher by the name of Proudhon who had written the, um, the philosophy of poverty, um, to which Marx responds... Uh, with a pamphlet called The Poverty of Philosophy, which, you know, in that witty. And, um, and literally, he trashes the guy to say that, well, Mr. Proudhon, uh, basically published in Germany and in France, France and Germany and Europe were sort of the centers at the time. Um, Mr. Proudhon has the advantage of, in France, being uh, thought of as a, uh, as a great German economist, and in, and in uh, Germany being thought of as a great French philosopher. Well, I'm German, and, you know, and I can tell you that he's neither. You know, it's kind of one of these things like I knew JFK and you, sir, or no, no JFK. And, you know, of course, the crowd goes wild. And now he's got some little dunk points on some, you know, guy named Proudhon. Um, and now he gets really like his now his, he's got temerity and he writes a, an analysis of Hegel where he um, basically criticizes Hegel that he has too much reliance upon religion Um you know, this, is, this begins where he later on will opine that religion is the opiate of the masses. Um, but really what, what he should be looking at, which is obvious to the world, is that the master-slave relationship is one of proletariat capitalism and the underlying power dynamic isn't power. It is exploitation. It is oppression. So this is what he adds to the dialogue. When you look at history... The only measurement stick is materialism. So that which you get, you know, the, how much material possessions you gather 
is the currency that you evaluate. Um, that's how you determine who the Goliath is in the power dynamic. And the power dynamic is one of theft, one of oppression, one of abuse, one of, uh, you know, you took it from someone else. Now, uh, not, not going to make this about a economic critique, but it completely, completely is devoid of any sort of basic math. Like the idea of the zero-sum game is wrong. The idea of the oppression thing is wrong. Everything is wrong about that uh, impression. But to an audience, a specific audience, that sounds fucking awesome. And because it has this pernicious introduction of this new class and the class consciousness and the, this promise of like, well, capitalism is going to collapse any minute and then the new intelligentsia is going to basically lead the proletariat because the proletariat themselves being uneducated, they don't have this class consciousness. So they need this extra special smart people to lead them. So that is catnip to every single not good enough intellectual of the time. Because here's like a, a, a new, it's a new pyramid scheme, right? Join early. And if you don't know what class consciousness is, don't worry. We offer on the job training. We'll teach you all the Marxist words to describe class consciousness. And then you could be one of this new class, this new intelligentsia that leads the new world. Right? So it attracts a lot of intellectuals. But there's a pernicious aspect to it because A, the whole theory is completely, well, it's been very, very criticized in its time. And in fact, most of the econom economicians of the time said it is devoid of any sort of economic theory. All of the social theory scientists said it is devoid of any actual social theory. <laughs> so it actually doesn't, doesn't provide you any insight into the dynamics of society. It provides you some 10 arbitrary planks of like how to achieve a great communist state. Um, and you can read those in some other place. But, you know, things like let's confiscate all of the means of transportation and, commun and communication so that way people can't move and talk. Let's confiscate all property rights and take all private property from immigrants and enemies because we don't want them to have any. Um, and let's uh, offer new schools for the children because we need to indoctrinate them early. Like, you know, th just the, the Communist Manifesto alone should have been like a deep signal of like, shit, that totally sounds totalitarian and worse than what's going on right now. I'm not sure how this would be good for the everyday person, but everybody skips that because there's that little tail end promise of, hey, you come with us, you'll be the leader. Be one of the new intelligentsia. So one by one, you know, he gets a whole bunch of people hypnotized to him. And then that translates through the ages. It goes through Lenin and then becomes communism. It goes through Gramsci and Mussolini, it becomes fascism. And it goes through Hitler, it becomes a national socialist. And it, goes, it just continues. Saddam, you know, the Baad Party. I mean, you know, M Mobuto, or, uh, Mugabe, I mean, uh, almost every goddamn you know, end user of this, this BS theory has suffered. But we're not going to focus on Marxism. We're, we're getting to critical theory. So now you get into like the mid-50s, like Horkheimer, Adorno, all of the new left, all of the Frankfurt School that had sort of uh, developed their little Marxist thinking in uh, in Hitler's Reichs, uh, well, in in the uh, in the uh, Weimar Republic, and, and you know, and then when Hitler took over the Reichstag, even though he was a fellow derivative of Marxism, they went, oh shit, let's get the fuck out of here. And in the th in thirty five, they just booked it to New York uh, to Chicago, because uh, they weren't gonna be around because they knew how this thing was gonna play out, and they weren't in the same intellectual circles as good old Hitler. They were in the other camp, you know. They they took a different varietal. They were more of the socialist, commie kind of version or Fabian version, not the, not the you know let's work hard part. That you know at least that that you know that one emphasis was was Hitler's side, even though he in, insisted on nationalism, racial purity, all that other bullshit. But uh, yeah, they got the hell out of Dodge. But Horkheimer and Adorno published Critical Theory, and let's just say that this is just now a refined sophisticated version of the same bullshit thinking from before. It's basically, it's, it can be considered a theory insofar as it seeks to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. So it implies that they are enslaved. It implies that they must be liberated. So all of that negative shit that's implied there, that's just, you're supposed to just bite, bite a good chunk of that and accept it. Because, God forbid, should you push back, then, you know, obviously you're, you're going against Knowledge, you're going against the established truth. 
It's kind of like the climate argument. Shut up. Don't talk about it. The science is in. Or, you know, pay gap argument. Shut up. You're a racist. Shut up. You're a fascist. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. It's this is it. And if you don't accept it, you're an idiot. So then critical theory starts penetrating America. Now, I think we've established now the differences between theory and thinking. One has a little bit more of an empirical bend. One has a little bit more of a theoretical bend. However, where critical theory is unlike all other theories is that it continuously chooses to never interact with empirical evidence. Repeatedly, consistently. And why is it dangerous? Well, let's see. One is pretty clear. You understand the rules of it. Therefore, it's, it's sort of a bridge to get two people to comprehend one another. And we've lived with that sort of interaction, this public dialogue and the marketplace of ideas, you know, all these sort of uh, founders kind of thinking and enlightenment kind of thinking. However, because we've lived in this area, let's imagine two people entering a dialogue and trying to convince one another of whatever. Well, there's, there's an element to the dialogue that let's just leave it in the category of nuance. Nuance. That which is unsaid or imprecisely said or insufficiently said or not even said at all. It's implied by tone. It's implied by inflection. It's implied by society. It's implied by surroundings. Because there is an assumption on the part of the speaker that his words, whatever context they are lacking in terms of being specifically included, being specified, uh, being appropriate for the level of resolution he's trying to commu uh, communicate at, that the listener would display some level of charity, some level of generosity, and interpret them in a positive manner. I mean, in a, in a you know, non-negative manner, let's just say. It doesn't even have to be positive. But but in a normal, rational manner. Now, that implies that you have no lens, no, no context, no, no pre-established context of interpretation. There is no philosopher that says, you must employ this lens when looking at this interaction. But now, critical theory, you have a permalens of oppression. And it's not just that you're looking for oppression. Because you've done this before, you've looked at history, you've studied it, you've had professors reinforce it for you, when you look at something through oppression, there's a bunch of implieds already there. There's an oppressor and there's an oppressed. There's a morality structure. The oppressed is to be pitied, to be, you know, defended. You, you root for the underdog. Maybe they're just, you almost get a level of, like, purity of spirit to the oppressed because, you know, they're, they're basically non-functional in that point. So they haven't done anything bad. By comparison, the oppressor is doing something bad to the oppressed. Therefore, the delta between the two is huge. So the delta of morality between the two is huge. Now, you come in as the superior thinking person from the future, from whatever, from the whatever perspective viewpoint you have. You already know that there's oppression, because you can see it. And your goal is to stop it. How much better are you than either both of them, Right? Because you're definitely better than the oppressor, because you sure as hell don't want to oppress. You're going the other way. And you're a hell of a lot better than the oppressed, because you're going to do something about it. So now you're sitting on this pretty rarefied air stack of morality that you didn't earn. Because you looked for an oppression that might have been there. I mean, if you're already looking for it, you will find it. Right? Because there's any a number of ways to interpret a situation. And maybe there is an element of oppression. But maybe there's an element of codependence. Maybe, I mean, maybe there's 50,000 other reasons bundled in with that one. But once you look for that one, you ignore all the others. You have no sense of how much is oppression actually a participant. It could be 0.1%, but that's all you see. And immediately, that puts you on a very, very high moral pedestal versus the oppressor. Now, move that to the present. Now you're interacting with a person, an opponent. An opponent who doesn't share your sensibilities, your views. Therefore, he is an oppressor. And he is engaging in a possible attempt at oppression in this dialogue. And you were going to fix him. That's your job. You're already way higher on the moral pedestal than he is, right? Obviously. Um, but 
if you're that much higher, that kind of makes him, I mean, kind of like the other oppressors, right? He's pretty much scum. He's kind of evil. He's kind of like reprehensible. He's kind of con beyond contempt, right? So when you must judge the unsaid pieces, the nuanced pieces of one's speech, and you are not previously motivated to be friendly, charitable, generous, neutral, whatever, if you're already predisposed to look at him and see Satan, whatever he hasn't specifically said, you could interpret as, well, if you were neutral, you might interpret it as, well, he didn't mean that, he probably meant the more generic thing, maybe he meant like the colloquial, whatever, but if he's Satan, you know that whatever is not said, he must have fucking been doing something. It's like a weird, bad, racist, sexist, feminist, evil, something. He, that there's just some evil there. Even though it's unsaid, even though we don't necessarily have any proof for it, but it's just, it's part of that gap, that, that, that nuance that has to be interpreted negatively. There's no other choice because it fits the personality you are engaging. You've already prejudged it. And then you have this, this lens that normally finds oppression in history. Well, he, that's going to find it anywhere it looks. And the more you find it, the more critical the problem gets because god damn this oppression is everywhere and for all of your life you've been fighting against it, and look you're making no progress racism is just as bad as it was during slavery times you know equal rights fuck even though women's rights are you know have been like miles and miles away from where they've been just even 50 years ago with been no progress made because you keep fighting it right you keep finding it everywhere therefore the world is horrible and you must fight it at all turns and it's just much like sort of the attitude of always being exposed to a certain negative element, you begin to become that which you hate. Imagine how effective that is for, let's say, two heads of state engaging with that mentality when they're trying to, to arrive at a common denominator. Let's say if they're, I don't know, equally on equal footing militarily. Huh. Now, if one is overwhelmingly above the other, then, yeah, maybe there's some progress to be made because one can be forced. But can one reason? If you were, Can you reason with Satan? Can you reason with Hitler? Can you reason with the embodiment of all which you find uh, contemptuous, beyond contempt, or, or deeply sinful, or like to the level of, you know, satanic evil, if you're religious? I would say, no, you can't. Now, this type of education... When we called it Marxism, people still kind of turn their nose at Marxism. They don't turn their nose at postmodernism, intersectionalism, blah, 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 as much. But in the 1800s, we called it Marxism. And it got into Harvard in 1895. And it's been cranking out elite thinkers for our country. People that went into government, people that began to lead the ACLU, the NAACP, the, the UN. The, you know, the everything. There's been some element of, you know, Harvard grads get everywhere because, you know, it's Harvard. It's awesome. Well, if Harvard grads had, say, a philosophy degree or kind of, let's say, a communications, uh, communication sciences degree or poli sci degree or, I don't know, some sort of studies, well, that's, that's the line of thinking they took. And critical theory was the lens that they now apply to interaction. Not they apply to political interaction. Because once you use it long enough, you understand that all interactions are power interactions. They're interactions of master-slave. They're interaction of oppressed and uh, oppressor, of uh, capitalist and exploited. And you begin to see that little shade everywhere. Everywhere. And you can't unsee it now because that's the filter you take. Now, how do you go through life interpreting every single interaction as basically a conflict of abuse. Ew, that paints a picture of a world, doesn't it? Let's just go through, uh, I'll call this an extra credit example. Now, we, thought, we, we kind of talked originally about critical thinking as being the desirable algorithm to have as your perception algorithm. And that whole little definition of it has to be self-correcting, self-monitoring, self-adjusting, uh, self self started self-discipline, self, all that. Well, here's the problem. Your perception is at one layer of your cortex and of your cognitive space. But there are many layers, right? 
you know, like Freud would say the super ego and the ego. Then there's the the ego ideal, the who you want to be. And then there's the id. Well, there's a whole bunch of subconscious. And even though, let's say, today someone provides you with a stupid idea, one that is just stupid, irrational, it, it can, like, get the hell out of here with this idea. Here's the problem. You fought it. You battered it off. You, you applied your critical thinking. But it's still in your memory. There's a vestige there. It's a memory of the idea, the, the primitive. But it hasn't gone to your concepts. It hasn't been accepted. It's not functional, right? Years pass. And here's a little example of. There was a guy by the name of Henri Bergson. He was a philosopher at the beginning of the century, and he had this pretty complex thing, and kind of he got into some correspondence with, uh, with James. William James was one of the big philosophers on, on our side of the pond. But uh, basically, kind of summarized what his main thinking was, was that he made a series of arguments of like duration and time and blah, blah, blah. But he said immediate experiences and intuition, so the personal, are more significant than abstract rationalism and science for understanding reality. Now, on its face, you kind of go, yeah, right, right? Like he's saying feelings and like intuition and emotions and imprints and stuff like that, they're usually a better guide for reality. And obviously the, the scientific in you rebels and says, you're a fucking idiot. As did nearly most writers of note in his time. And here's the strange part. Bertrand Russell... Um, you know, G. Moore, uh, Wittgen, uh, Wittgenstein, and Heidegger. Like, Bertrand Russell was a socialist, was a Marxist, basically. He was part of the Fabian Society. Wittgenstein and Heidegger were German uh, philosophers that weren't that dissimilar from Hegel in many respects. They were more on the analytical, you know, uh, more nihilistic in many ways. But Benda, Stevens, Valéry, um, Piaget, one of the behaviorists of our, you know, top behaviorists of our time, Adorno, a big Frankfurt School guy, Coletti, Sartre, you know, uh, Pulitzer, Blanchot, Babbitt, Lovejoy, Royce, a whole bunch of them. Every fucking one panned him. He said, this is bullshit. This is, you know, th th your thinking is flawed, blah, 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 blah. So this concept, this immediate experience and intuition trumping rational thought. Well, you know, we have this concept today. It made it through the gauntlet. It's called the lived experience. And you hear it in intersectional theory and all Marxist derivative uh, theory, and it's made it into postmodern thinking, post-structuralism, all the places where these guys were the gatekeepers. It made it through, even though it got panned and killed. So if you're not diligent about applying, you know, you, you might have rejected it then, but then it's in your memory bank somewhere. And then if you've accepted a few invalid propositions buried in your relativism and in your you know power dynamic implication and your you know screwed in the lens and all that stuff you've already accommodated broken thinking in your thing so now as you're trying to formulate your thoughts you need a concept that fits that fits this thing this justification and and rationality no longer fits here because you've accepted too many things that break it and then comes this concept unbidden from the subconscious saying lived experience the immediate experience and intuition being superior to rationalism and science. And all of a sudden, that same idea that once you thought was idiotic as hell now becomes your idea. And it's an awesome idea. And it makes it in the new canon of books. And that's how we go from critical thinking to critical theory. Now, that's it for critical theory, the explanation. But for extra, extra credit, I decided to provide you with a structural definition of insert name here theory. Because one might, if you were to gander at, say, Wikipedia and look at, sort of drill in what critical theory means from a perspective of the curriculum, of, uh, from the sciences, from the disciplines that are now available in our illustrious halls, yeah, there are a ton. For example... You might be familiar with some of the hoax papers. Uh, one of the weaknesses of postmodernism, Marxism, blah, 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 because it relies upon smart-sounding words, uh, what we like to call grandiloquence or neologisms. These words, these invented words that you keep adding to shit, like, is this a performative aspect of what you're doing? Um, basically, it's this whole genre of science is kind of susceptible to pure bullshit being put on paper and passed as a legitimate paper and approved and being you know, praised. 
because it just feeds into a bunch of illogical shit and they eat it up. Um, but it has spawned gender theory, queer theory, trans theory, trans studies, women's studies, Afro-American studies, Native American studies, post-colonial studies, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I can go on forever, but the element here is grievance. There's some population that was grieved, was aggrieved, was oppressed, was something back in the past. And this is generally how all theories work. There's this concept of existing society, and then the aggrieved, the member of the aggrieved group is somehow pointed to by somebody else, and is, he is made aware that he is one of the aggrieved, and it begins to articulate a story. Now, the society is called a master hegemony. It's those people that now have control. It's, it's, there's an implication there of, like, unjust control. Because, it's, of course, it's always only a power, an authority structure. It's a hierarchy, but it's not a hierarchy of merit. It's a hierarchy of power and abuse. Um, and it has a class hierarchy. And you're usually not amongst the higher classes. Or if you happen to be amongst the higher classes, you're still... Th there's that immediate de de uh, like de weird detachment where you can now project yourself or project your feelings... To be, com to be sort of commensurate with that which is the lowest in that society. And now you can project and you can feel for them. That expiates you from any sort of sin of being in that other class. Now, the, this class, to, to keep its power, has cultivated a series of normative myths. That's the new word, normative. Normative. It, because they want to make things normal. So things like moral values. Yeah, yeah, you think that they're arbitrary or, I mean, you think that they're objective realities, but they're not. There's no such thing as moral, the way they're describing it. That's just a tool to keep you down. You know, you need to, you need to, you need to break out of that thinking. Cultural ethics? No, no, no. That's again, that's that's another tool they invented to oppress you. So being a good boy, being say diligent and working hard, that's just a myth they fed you to keep you down. You don't have to work to get rich. Do you think they work to get rich? No. And, and when they hit you with this bullshit about established facts, those aren't facts. Those are fictions they've created to keep you down. Now, there's roles in this, uh, in this uh, society, and of course, they're also normative. What, that there's a role for the wife in the house? No, 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 no. This, this, there's no. There's no validity to that concept of a role. The employer decides your job description, and you say that you have to stick to it because... You know, you would be in subordinate, subordination. No, no, that, those concepts are there to keep you down. They're there to marginalize you, right? They're all designed for marginalizing these people who they've decided they're going to take advantage of. So, of course, it, there's always an oppression dynamic, right? Some of it's overt, some of it's covert. Most of it tends to be covert, the more you ask, because almost any dynamic you'll point to, they'll find a reason why it's an oppression dynamic. It's just, it's just covert rather than overt. Some of it's that simple, that's overt. Um, because, like, think about it. They control all the resources. And the way you get rewarded? Well, think about that. The only way you get rewarded is if they approve of you. If you do a good job, you get paid better. Well, who says you did a good job? They do. If you make a whole bunch of stock, you get rewarded for it. See, that's another artificial metric. If you have a lot of efficiency and output and production. Fuck that, man. These are all bullshit metrics that are there to keep you down. And of course, because of that, you see, when, when I point out all of this oppression to you, can you not see that some sort of revolt is imminent? Everybody's being oppressed. Every single person is being treated like you. You see that lens now at work, right? Now, in contrast, if you were to look at because within this culture, there's the culture of the hegemonic patriarchy and the, the, the masters. There's also the culture of the slave, right? There's the culture of the aggrieved. Well, let's talk about that because there's a lot of depth there. Because the aggrieved, they have a unique and typically beneficial perspective that the world could benefit from. They've been silenced all this time. Oftentimes, this class, they're foundational, they're essential. They built this civilization. It's been built on the back of them. All the accomplishments were theirs, and then the master class took credit. They are the true culture builders. They derive the real achievements. And they, being this aggrieved class, nevertheless trudged on delivered achievements, delivered culture, delivered the society on their back. So they, because of that, they've evolved a higher morality. 
Now, there is repressed behavior there. There's either the noble suffering, like the person who is very intelligent, he sees it, but he will suffer along until the time it come, until the right time comes to rise up. Or there is sort of the Stockholm syndrome people, you know, the ones that are the approval-seeking turncoats who like have been so beaten dog down that that now they turn around, they try to please their masters. Those people are just they they just broke, you know, they're just turncoats. Now there's been a few episodes of thwarted attempts of establishing equity and it's just you know they didn't work whatever equity that there's been whatever disparity used to be and maybe got close that that's invalid that's you know we're still not there that means it hasn't worked and uh, of course it's always the the observations are sort of this incisive wisdom you know this attacking this destruct like a biting out of and it's always an acute perspective they can see they have this very very kind of ability to penetrate and look at any structure in the society and 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 look at its core elements and of course one of the elements is oppression and another element is power like they can dissect anything you know like how a doctor's position a diagnostic you know anything anything can be dissected into this element of oppression this element of uh, conform com, uh, you know conformality and uh, normative behavior and sort of uh, like the normative cis uh, cis male kind of behavior that kind of shit and, of course, because they have such an incisive and penetrating view, they can deconstruct the concept, and they can see how, by deconstructing society, they could rebuild it better. So by destroying it, they could do better. And, of course, there is a solidarity with ethos, because they have a mission. It is to help others to see, help others to break free, help others overcome and achieve their true selves. Well, Insert whatever oppression with whatever group here. Change women for the group. Change black Americans. Change Latin Americans. Change Native Americans. Change, you know, the blind, the disabled, the, the trans, the whatever. Insert whatever group. That's the, the theory, usually. And then you launch into a whole studies of where you start contemplating all of the great unique achievements and unique perspective that would have been so beneficial to society had they just been allowed to provide it. And then, you know, the second half of this is criticizing anything at all, in, in, you know, any and all achievements that might have been quote-unquote accomplished by the hegemonic patriarchic, you know, society, because obviously they didn't do those. It was actually the other aggrieved. And then you start seeing the structure. Now, for extra, extra, extra credit, there is a weird kind of parallelism here. The religion. Most, most of, most in, you know, most apropos would be even uh, Catholic, Christian faith. If you look at most cultural phenomena today of the aggrieved, you'll see that there's, there's a very sharp overlap. So they're all sort of communal. They're all basically provide you the meaning, belongings type sense, right? They're, there's an us-them dynamic. So if you're, a, let's say you're big into environmentalism or, or feminism or whatever, you know, you, you join your group and they make you feel welcome, goddammit. You're, uh, you're with us, not with them. Um, us, them, good, evil. We're good, they're evil. They're just, you know, they're fucking up the world, we're going to save it. Um, which immediately gives you that extra moral dopamine kick. You're now on an upper platform of morality, not, not, not with the contemptuous folks. And of course, now, there is a price to pay. You must accept a specific worldview, and it just happens to have a little skew in it, but if you don't poke at it too much, they won't point it out. Much like, you know, you want to be a Christian, Christ died on the cross, and then he came back to life. You don't buy that, forget it, you're not a Christian. Now, their, their skew is a little different. Maybe it's um, feminism. Maybe it's like, you know, this is the pay gap. If you don't accept the pay gap as a world, or if you don't accept depression as the narrative, or if you don't accept, you know, whatever idyllic creation myth of like how there used to be a matriarchal world that was peaceful, and then man came around and made it brutal, or if you don't accept the fact that capital is... Uh, capitalism has screwed up the world, whatever. All of these components, there, there's always one thing that you have to accept, you know, so give us this one aberration and then all the world will make sense. There's a creation myth. There's original sin, like privilege, for example. You know, you might have been privileged, but then you can atone for it. Um, there's this element of salvation, because obviously, you know, there's, there's the cruelty of the world, aka, say, oppression, inequality, blah, blah, blah. And there's the salvation aspect that we're going to fix it. There's the Armageddon aspect of it, the uh, imminent collapse of capitalism, imminent collapse of class structure, imminent collapse of whatever, you know, whatever pernicious behavior 
it's going to collapse tomorrow, uh, whatever it is. There's the concept of uh, equality of heaven, the utopia world, the part the world we're going to build. There's the concept of post-salvation, you are now born again, or as we say today, you're woke. Of course, there's canon literature, right? There's, there's the Apocrypha, there's the um, content of the canonical Bible, right? You have, you know, you have your own, you have your entire corpus of literature. Basically, all of the studies and, you know, starting from William Money transgendering to, you have your own saints like Judith Butler, for example, or, you know, uh, Jack Derrida or whatever. You have your prophets, your, you know, your, ma your massive, you know, big boys, Marx, for example. And then the disciples of the prophets, you know, Lenin, Trotsky. And you have some of the fallen angels, like, say, Hitler. Um, you have commandments and you have doctrine. So, for example, there's a whole bunch of statements we're supposed to, to utter. And going against the doctrine can be blasphemy. Like, like, if you say things like there's only two sexes or there's no such thing as a pay gap, that's blasphemy. You better repent. Then you got heretics. Right, you got heretics like like second wave feminists, the ones that fought for you know like the the sexual revolution, but then thought okay, it's getting a little bit too anti male. When they start saying that shit, they're talking heresy. First wave feminists, the ones that kind of checked out after the first wave, they're apostates because they used to be in our camp, but they left, and now they're criticizing us, and there should be death for those people. Those people get punished more than the more than the heretics, more than the infidels, more than the unbelievers, more than the barbarians. Because they should have known better. They left the faith. There's no better punishment than to punish the ones who leave the faith. Um, there's the infidel, you know, the cis-normative males. The ones that keep, you know, like acting, you know, the toxic males. The ones that don't know, the, the, they're just too dim to see the toxicity of their own behavior. And, that, you know, your job is to save these people. Or if they can't be saved, obviously, to destroy them. Of course, there, there's the concept of excommunication. Certain people are just no longer, they can't be part of the faith. They get deplatformed. They get pushed away. Away with you. Gone. There's the penance. Okay, so let's say that we're going to let you back in, but you must express contrition and, and, and perform penance. A contrition would be the public apology saying how you've learned, how you've matured, how those things you used to say you don't believe anymore. And then, of course, penance are actions. You know, you're going to deploy some diversity training at your company, or you're going to deplatform others, or you're not going to do business with certain people. And of course, it has the cardinal virtues, you know, the cardinal virtues versus the deadly sins. Like equity is a virtue. You know, outcome is a virtue. Equality, nah, no. Opportunity doesn't the same as equity, right? That's, that's the opposite. That, then you're going to get lambasted for saying that one. That's a sin. Multiculturalism versus integration. No, we keep all the cultures intact. They don't have to mix. Because who are you to judge if one's better than the other? And what do you mean they can't function in a complete society? They have to integrate. No, that's a sin. You're a racist. There's race diversity. We are big on diversity, inclusion. Inclusion, diversity. Well, wait a minute. How about idea diversity? Nah, you're racist, fascist, white supremacist. Or like, let's say, trans fluid. You know, the idea that you could, you could, you know, you're fluid. You're, you're gender in specific uh, uh, versus this, this horrific sin of biorealism, like saying that there's two sexes. Things like that. And I can go on for pages because almost every single idiosyncratic behavior in religion absolutely exists in intersectionality, in Marxism, in feminist theory, in whatever theory, in all theories. So, I'll leave it to you. Yes, as much as critical as I've been, there is some benefit to all of these theories to the degree that the oppression or the the, the perceived grievance exists in some form, it is worth fighting. Because those are unfair practices that we have re recognized as a civilization and have addressed. However, and I think, you know, and take that for what it's worth, coming from a white male who should have no perspective on this, but I do nonetheless. Um, racism. Race needs to become inconsequential in all of our interactions. That would signal the end of racism. Now, it would be idiotic to say that, that we haven't made great strides in the realm of racist behavior, starting from slavery to today. Civil rights. All of these accomplishments we've had are miles from where we were. Now, if, however... 
the media and education continues to harp on a narrative of con complete and ever-present racism, which is what we have, you can't ever eliminate it because it is kept top of mind. And the more top of mind something is, the more it gets referenced. And the more, even if you are not racist, if you're continuously being accused of being racist, then pretty soon you grow the resentful lashing out behavior, right? So there comes a point, there's the, the sort of fulcrum dynamics in physics where there is a certain tipping point where now the weight carries it the wrong way and everything topples. So while you're attempting to balance something on your way up, you want to make sure that you don't reach past the fulcrum and then topple the whole thing. And that's the danger here. Because the natural progression of something is to eradicate the behavior. Well, you do that by addressing the fundamental structure, structural things of the society, laws. We've done that. Racism, discrimination, all those things are against the law. We even went a bit further and we overcompensated. We created the welfare state, the uh, affirmative action, all that thing. Now, from a conservative perspective, the wise thing would have been to put markers in place, key metrics, key indicators, and measure continuously. Today, having the benefit of you know uh, retrospective and, and having the, the disadvantage of never deploying metrics truly to monitor it, now we can look at a whole bunch of years having accrued and the negative effects that they've accrued, you know, the dissolution of the family, the high degree of incarceration, the, the fathers not being in the home. All of that stuff led to a negative culture, right? which basically amplified a whole bunch of bad behavior that we thought, you know, we didn't think of back then. We thought it would just, it would all heal because of the elimination of Jim Crow and segregation, all that stuff. And it didn't, it got worse because we've replaced that with a bad incentive. But when you can't have a discussion about this, when one side of the house decides to look at a lens, pick up a lens and use that for everything, and anything that doesn't, it, that whatever that lens is isolates a piece of the dialogue. You can't say anything about race. You can't say anything about whatever, right? That that dialogue is now marginalized. Not marginalized. It's wiped out. It's wiped off the map. Well, whenever you can't have it, you're invariably you're going to have some sort of factual finding that must rely on a discussion about it that you can no longer have. So now you're allowing more and more and more invalid facts to enter your core concepts and at that point almost nothing in the world works at that point you get to where we are today where where objectively this, like unmoored statements completely insane statements are being made on television as if they are objective reality without any sort of uh, ability to perceive the fact that you know you've gone off the off the deep end you're in the loony bin now and you just don't see it. Because now you have a, think about this, 1895, we start cranking out Harvard grads. Now, obviously, they didn't just stay in Harvard, right? They, they've, every single college right now has basically, all, any, any, anything that you could legitimately call liberal art is basically populated by, at a minimum, let's say Democrats, but I'm inclined to say Marxists. Right? But by and large, there's no, Repub there's no conservative, there's no Republican, there's, no, there's none of that, that range of thinking anywhere close to any of those sciences. Of the few that, that basically start dissenting with, uh, with the accepted norm, they typically are liberals, classic liberals. Like, so basically think of what used to be the left long ago, what was called American classic liberal values, which now basically are accused of being Nazi. <laughs> I mean, think of Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson's a Nazi in that frame. And I mean, it's not, he's a Nazi because he somehow wants to maintain a centrist, a fundamentally leftist, centrist view, left center, pretty much. But now he's just so far from the extreme left that he's, he's a Nazi. It's, he's no different than, than, you know, Attila the Hun. Um, that, that polarization, that type of view throughout all of our, throughout all of our, uh, educational halls and what do they crank out writers communication majors like you know the typical person that gets into say news publications the communications becomes an administrative staff at a company for diversity 
there's sort of this pernicious cycle, right? Because you've you've already kind of addressed that that little that that little call to 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 sort of the let's say the not the mo not the most strong morally the the, the self-serving bias, right? When Marx announced his little pitch of proletariat and capitalism, when he first floated it, Communist Manifesto, it didn't get that far, right? The, 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 the hierarchy of the day, this was his way to, 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 to push himself into the, the upper strata of philosophy, and they just kind of looked at him and said, you're a moron. Because it looked like it was basically the whiny complaints of a, just a, um, a person with a will to power, but the ineptitude to reach it, right? It's the frustrated uh, desire for power. The frustrated will to power not reaching it so because he was obsessively materialistic i mean you know for all of his condemnation of the material he was he judged the world materialistically and it was very much a resentment type uh philosophy and then he retooled he made it into a pyramid scheme right he basically said oh wait wait we'll keep the same proletariat dynamic and that'll be the that'll be the pitch for the end user the client pitch now we're going to create a structure to sell it so now he had another pitch the partner pitch which all of a sudden proletariat became lumpen proletariat. Lumpen proletariat. Lumpen? Ah, you want to know what that means? Think of it. What would you mean if you called someone a lump? Right? The lumpen proletariat didn't have this refined class consciousness, but the new intelligentsia, the, the new class, the new, the, the perfect intelligentsia, this new class that he was recruiting did. And don't worry if you don't figure out what class consciousness is, because, hey, Marxism will teach you on the job training. Come here, learn to be a boss. Come to us, recruitment. So they've recruited, and it's gone viral. So now, replace lumpen proletariat with this normative males, and then replace class consciousness to, you know, uh, the environmental movement, the feminist movement, the diversity movement, the whatever. I mean, pick, pick your grievance, right? But that's the class consciousness. And now you've got the failed intellectuals of the day all of a sudden, they can go to this other remedial training program and become successful in society and be in a circle that reinforces and narcissizes their, their experience. They, they, they feed each other. We have an entire class of people that are convinced are intelligent, are convinced. And nothing you say will matter because when you can't, when you point out to a Marxist, the idiocy of some of his uh, tenets. The response is never, hmm, I didn't think of that. It's always, I find it bizarre that you would, you would like interpret Marx this way because obviously, you know, there's a lot more which you just don't understand. And, and there's a whole bunch of verbiage, usually restating the fact that they're shocked that you can't understand it, typically a number of ways, and then giving you, at best, if they continue, they'll, they'll give you an example that is completely unrelated to the problem at hand and provide to you know, proceed to congratulate themselves on the, the, the just dunk they just did on you because they totally proved it. But it doesn't prove it, right? It's not, there is no adherence to actual rational thought and, but there is no perception of that either because this in, insistent on your science, on your little rules, but that, that, that's this normative behavior that you're trying to push on me, dude. Don't oppress me. So therefore, you can stay in this elevated state of super intelligence and all these other goddamn normies around there that have been brainwashed, you know, they're not woke. So you can stay in your super state of intelligence, never realizing that you're actually walking around pretty dumb. And now, because we also have a whole bunch of people that haven't had the time or the inclination or, or the resources to educate them and educate themselves in the upper tiers, when they hear the verbiage of a postmodernist, a poststructuralist, a, a, a racial theorist, a, a woman's studies theorist, that sounds intelligent. If I'm only a mechanic, I can't tell what the difference is between a physicist and a post-whatever theorist, right? But then you can hear some of the intelligent intellectuals of the time. Just listen to, Norman, uh, to Norm Chomsky basically just ripping the shit out of postmodernism about all the same characteristics which I thought, which is like the, the ability to basically be part of yet stand disconnected from a problem and comment on it insightfully without providing any real solutions. The complete crime he saw that in, you know, as Africa was 
beginning to get into its de- you know quasi developmental stages. They sent a whole bunch of people to the West to get educated, and they came back with postmodern degrees and completely trashed their respective countries because that wasn't actual knowledge, that wasn't actual intelligence, and they needed intellectuals, and they came back with these quasi-intellectuals that just whined a lot and basically provided no solutions. Um, the complete damage that these, that this, because it's like fake, it's, it's a fake credential that never gets found out. Imagine that. Imagine being a fake mechanic, and yet somehow you have this amazing ability that every time the person takes the car and it just breaks down a foot away from your door, they never blame you. Because you've managed to somehow get them to blame the street or blame society or blame somebody else that has nothing to do with it, just not you. Imagine being able to be that mechanic. How many cars would be running in your neighborhood by the time you retire? None. Well, that's it, except replace the car with society. Then you got a bigger problem. Well, so that's my bit about theory. And I think that went just way ranty and way long, but... I think it expresses my, my, my full range of disdain. If you like it, comment. If you don't, comment again. See you later.